Mm-hmm. Okay, we're starting to this afternoon and we're looking at the idea of individualism and spirituality. <laughs> Correct. Whew. Jonathan Kemp will be leading us and for the purposes of people doing distance said, Jonathan Kemp is the director of Youth, <coughs> Children and Families Ministry, all words to that effect, okay. uh, within the Brisbane Anglican Diocese or Anglican Church Southern Queensland as it's sometimes called. I'll hand over to Jonathan. Thanks very much. Hi everybody, thanks for being here. Am I right in thinking this is actually technically your holidays or something like that? No? Yes? For some people. Okay. Alrighty, well we're going to leap underway. So, I um, uh, believe you've been looking at uh, some of the microsystems and things like that that influence uh, youth culture. And so what we're going to do is, from this afternoon and for the next couple of units, next time we meet, we're going to look at some of the macro systems, which are much further, some of the big isms that are there. So. Um, we're going to be looking at these three things. So when we put together some isms for the course as to what these big isms might be, we actually had quite a few to pick from, because really we're talking about the whole world of postmodernism and everything else. So we decided we'd pick three isms that we thought were particularly influential, and these are individualism, globalism and consumerism. So today we'll look at individualism. From time to time, I, I uh, abbreviate that as iism. So that's what that is. Uh, just because I got sick of writing it out, and I thought I'd, I thought I'd encourage you to come up with a shorthand way of writing that out if you so, so chose. So individualism, next time we'll look at globalism and consumerism. There is considerable crossover between these three things. So uh, don't be surprised if from time to time something comes up that has come up before, or if you say to yourself, this sounds more like globalism or consumerism or vice versa, yeah, we know. <laughs> There's, there's no nice way of dividing all these things up because cultural analysis means that uh, everything is mixed up in the culture. Maybe that's part of the point of what we're doing. Okay, I'm intending to move fairly rapidly this afternoon. Um, so uh, all going well. We'll be out of here in no time at all, but um, we certainly won't be going any shorter than we need to. Um, but with your cooperation, we'll move pretty rapidly. A quick word about what we won't be discussing. From time to time in the texts, you'll come up with this word individuation. Uh, that's not what we're talking about today. Individuation comes up in things like Fowler's Stages of Faith and elsewhere, where they're talking about the normal kind of process by which people develop a kind of an individual identity and so on. So Fowler talks about that in a, in a, uh, uh, a spiritual sense. Um, other people use it in another sense, but we're not talking about that word individuation. That's another long word. Uh, that we're not talking about. I'm also not going to go very deeply into the whole history of the individual as a concept. Um, this is a fascinating area, <laughs> covered at length by numerous other authorities, uh, and how this idea of the individual being recognised as a person, as opposed to you just being, say, a Roman soldier or a, uh, a Viking or some other, some other sort of entity, a slave or whatever. Um, uh, the paper, one of the readings I give you from Richard Rice, actually spends a, a few pages going through that very rapidly. That's a very nice summary. Alternatively, if you're really interested, you can go to Wikipedia or anywhere else and um, read through the history of the individual. Go right ahead. But that's also not what we're talking about. Um, I'm also not going to get into things like hedonism, anarchism, and other forms of the individual taken to a kind of a philosophical extreme. Uh, likewise, if you're interested in those things, you can, uh, well, do all sorts of crazy things. Uh, take some hallucinogens and go and do whatever feels good. Um, no, don't do that. Um, so, uh, no, not talking about those things. And lastly, uh, really important to understand, and we'll spell this out in a bit more detail later on, it, the notion of individuality um, is important and is valuable and is good. Uh, but is different from individualism that we're talking about, okay? So individuality, when we talk about that, we're talking about personal traits or quirks or something like that. Uh, that's okay, and I'll try and spell out the difference. Uh, I'm just spelling out that we're going to be using a lot of words that sound a bit like each other, but they are quite different from each other at different points, okay? So moving on to what we will be talking about today, here's a definition of individualism. Uh, where it's a dominant feature of Western society that encourages individual freedom at the cost of traditional family ties and social cohesion and stresses individual initiative. 
Needless to say, you'll have access to this PowerPoint, so you need not copy out every word, but the red writing is my emphasis. Uh, a feature of Western society and culture that encourages individual freedom at the cost of traditional family ties and social cohesion and stresses individual initiative. It relies on the belief that individual freedom forms the basis of entrepreneurial or capitalistic culture, which is the best guarantee of an ever expanding economy. In forthcoming weeks, we'll tie this in with globalism and consumerism. You'll notice that this definition comes from businessdictionary.com, which I think is kind of significant. Um, but I think it ties in nicely with what we're thinking about. We're thinking about the individual and modern society being kind of a consumer and uh, stressing individual freedom as opposed to this idea of community and collective activity and so on. That's the really critical thing here. Okay? All righty. Well, sorry, just sure. a question and if you yeah, don't yeah. answer the uh, How does that definition yep. uh, define somebody say in China? Yes. Um, I would argue in modern Chinese culture, with the rise of the middle class, it still makes sense. Yeah. But otherwise you would argue the Western society excludes China and we're not interested in them <laughs> for the purposes of this exercise. Uh, when in doubt, I've gone for the Australian example because I think that's what your, um, your course is mainly based on. It's but probably significant that the idea of uh, individualism is typical of Western society mm. and in, in other cultures it's not found to the same extent as it is yeah. That's what I'm trying to grasp. Yes. And particularly yes. when you tie it to economics and capitalism, yes. you're not going to have individualism in a communist society. Not yet. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah. 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 It'll be interesting to yeah. see. Uh, good question. Okay. So really quickly this afternoon, we're going to look at how individualism, sometimes just to say one more word, sometimes called individualization by some of the authors. Same thing there. Okay. Next week, globalism, globalization. Same thing. So individualism, how it has come to achieve a privileged position in modern Australian society, how this impacts upon young Australians and their culture, and your culture, how this impacts upon the expressions of spirituality of young Australians, and then some possible responses by good people like you ministering to youth. Okay? Alrighty, now we'll see if this clip works. Fingers crossed. Let's do this. Let's go here, let's go here. And yep. So this is just from yesterday, I think it was. Angelina Jolie winning a Nickelodeon award. Okay. Just have to do the um, function of that. Oops. Do that. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much to all the kids who voted. I want to say that when I was little, like what office in I Oh, that might be. I just hit the buffer. Let's go again. I was told that I was different, and I felt out of place, and too loud, too full of fire, never good at sitting still, never good at fitting in. And then one day I realized something, something I hope you all realize. Different is good. Okay. <laughs> all right. The... Uh... The other version of that clip I had said a little more, <laughs> um, but we'll roll with that, I think, nonetheless. Yeah, we'll roll yes. with that. Okay. We'll go back to the PowerPoint. I might tell you a little more of what she actually said uh, at that point. And... Yep. Okay. And we're back on track. Okay. <laughs> She essentially said, being different is good. Did anybody see her accepting the award? No? Even too recent? Okay. It's happened very recently. Um, she accepted the award. She basically said, being different is good. People told her she was different when she was younger and everything, and made her feel really bad about that. But uh, she's now encouraging people. She encourages each young person who's there, all those screaming fans at Nickelodeon, to be different and to embrace their difference. And then she says, because I've won the award for best villainess, I'm going to encourage you to basically be troublemakers, to basically, you know, stir up the pot, do your own thing, and, you know, to heck with the consequences, is essentially what I'm paraphrasing her as saying, okay? So I just want to take us, as to take a moment here, uh, you're going to have a chat to the person next to you. The numbers are nice and even. What do you see as the positives of that kind of view? Do your own thing, be different, 
embrace that difference. What's good about that, that point of view? What sort of positives can you get out of it? What kind of negatives are attached to that kind of view? Is there anything else interesting that you'd want to raise about that kind of view, maybe based on who Angelina is and what's happened to her? And uh, is this a call to individualism or is it just support for someone's individuality? We might cover that last one separately. Okay, do I just want to take a minute to discuss positives, negatives and interestings of that, that approach. If someone said that to you, just go and do your own thing. The negatives of her view is she doesn't, she hasn't gone on to explain that even with um, different reasons, she didn't go on to explain those limitations. Correct. Correct. Yeah. That's very good. Yeah, the whole dog will consult being feeling different than that can suck is a really good um, yeah. Yeah. yeah message to be passed yeah, around. For, for example, saying that yeah. yeah. In, uh, in a lot of ways being who you are, that being different is good. Um, yeah, but, yeah, but we have to be able to be together. Fantastic folks, okay, we might just collate, thanks very much, we might just collate a few ideas on what's there, okay, can someone give me a couple of positive things that they, you see from that message of Angelina's about difference being good, what's a positive way to, to interpret what she was saying? Um, yeah, yeah. 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 a couple, yeah. one each. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> Valuing diversity. Right. Super. That's absolutely right. Um, and we had challenging the status quo. Okay. Yep. Or social norms. All right. Oh yeah. Let's do that. Yep. Everyone happy that those are positive ways of taking that idea? I, I'd agree with you, gentlemen over here. Self-esteem issues. Uh, um, positive self-esteem. Right. Okay. Let's just say enhance or something like that. Enhance self-esteem. Yep. Be happy with who you are. Yep. Okay. Positive messages. Happy enough. Okay. Any any negative spin that you could see from that mm. particular message? She didn't go on to say that there are limitations. Yes, I'd say omitted. And what sort of limitations might there be? Well, we said that well, sometimes the status quo needs to be challenged, and that's a good thing. Yep. We also need to be able to live together. Yes. And agree on how to live together. Okay. And um, and Rosie, you had like you had that a really good point about it was almost like um, uh, lose, yeah losing, losing community, community, which is sort mm. of similar to that. Yes. What community? Sorry. Like just losing, losing any community. community. Yes. The concept of community. Correct. Living as individuals, doing our own thing. I'll agree with you. <laughs> yep. And the consequences. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much, okay. And any other interesting thoughts you might want to add in on how's this coming? Do you agree Angelina Jolie's pretty different? Uh, yeah, I think, well, obviously we didn't see the whole clip, but um, mm -hmm. if she, yeah, the whole villainess kind of, um, <laughs> well, if, she's, if she's using that as the framework for yeah. saying go out and be different and challenge, yeah. challenge you right. know, yourself, then that's... Is no. there a sort of an evil under? Yeah, yeah it's like, <laughs> yeah. Why, why, do you, yeah. why does it have to be because she's a villainess? Like, yeah, or correct. why does, she's well, actually painting that as being, it's a ba like a bad thing. So it's yes. a bit of a contradiction, I think. Yes. <laughs> good. Is, it a, is good. it a form of desensitising evil? Yeah. Well, I don't know, but like, she seems to just contradict herself. Like, okay. Yeah. Mm. Alright, good one. Okay, I also speculate a few things about, you know, if you're a person of particular wealth, privilege, etc. Does that give you, you know, uh, have you got more sort of freedom and space to do your own thing, make some mistakes? Mm. <laughs> you know, uh, have you got further room to fall if something should fall, etc. When you're loved by millions and you've got 500,000 Twitter followers or whatever she's got, etc. Or you've et got a, a PR guru. A PR machine behind you. Nice one. To, okay. to spin it. 
Yeah, okay, good. Um, all right, that's a, a good effort. Okay. So this last one, when she says be different, is that a call to individuality or is it a call to individualism? Like is she saying go out there and do your own thing and forget about community? Or is she, is she, is she putting it more nicely? I think she probably intended it as a call to individuality. Yes. And don't let people turn you into something you're not. I'll, I'll go with that. Mm. I must say, it grabbed me because it then sounds like, mm. if you think it through, like we've been doing, if everyone goes out there and does what she's just been saying to do, like rock the boat, you know, do your own thing, what is the, then the implication if everybody does that? And I think that's one of the interesting things about it. Okie dokie. So this question there, is individualism necessarily good or bad in itself? And this is pretty critical, I think, okay? So the argument from Matt Brain, who, uh, has he come up in the course so far? I don't think so, he's in the big all right, yeah, no dramas. So Matt Brain is uh, basically my counterpart in Canberra Goulburn, more or less. He does a few other things down there. He's an archdeacon now, I think, etc. Uh, but he wrote this book, Engage, How the Church Can Reconnect with Young People, which is essentially his PhD thesis sort of written up a bit. But he covers some of these themes quite nicely. It's a fairly slim volume, and he's got a couple of nice questions at the end, so you might like to flip through this uh, rapidly at some point. It sits on my bookshelf, and I'm sure there's one upstairs in Roscoe at least. But he and others are very, uh, are very critical. So the argument from Brain and others is that being immersed in a world where individualism is valued over the community or collective has profound emotional and spiritual consequences that is of a negative kind for people's private and public lives, okay? He, he really thinks that individualism is not a force for good. Um, for example, he says it leads to things like self-obsessive behavior. And we're gonna look at that next time we meet a bit more, uh, a focus upon personal rights and not on responsibilities. And this is a thing you hear pretty often, right? It's all rights, it's no responsibilities. I was a high school teacher for a long time. You constantly get teachers and others coming in complaining that some kid wants all the rights but shows no responsibility for whatever's going on. This argument about shallowness and a lack of commitment and so on, we'll need to tease this out a little bit, little bit more. But it's this, this idea that um, uh, if you're a, a person and it's all about you, if you see someone else who's got something that looks pretty good, you'll drop what you've got and go and grab whatever they're doing, is the idea, okay? So his argument is that uh, people tend to just jump from group to group, very mobile, and just doing whatever comes along, and so on. Uh, and this leads to a bit, basically a, a dissatisfaction with your place in life and so on. That there's a focus on the temporary rather than the permanent, we'll tease this out a bit more. And the argument is that there are actual health problems which can emerge from this. Uh, and we'll look at this a bit more. So depression and mental illness comes from this idea that nothing's permanent, everything's constantly moving, and um, I, I'm only relying on my own resources, it's all about me, and what I think's all good, but what if I don't know what's the best, etc. Or what if I don't find my own resources satisfactory, what, what do I do then? So there are some problems he sees in relation to individualism as a force. Uh, there's a book called Caroline, by Caroline Miley called The Suicidal Church. <laughs> I don't know who came up with the title, but it's pretty attention grabbing. Has anyone heard of this? Has anyone read it? Okay, all right. Again, I've, I've got a copy, I'd say there's one upstairs as well. The Suicidal Church by Caroline Miley. Well, this is quite a, um, uh, there's a, there's an Anglican clergyman who described it to me as a terrifying book, and I can understand why. So essentially what she's done is, she's, she's focusing mainly on the Diocese of Melbourne uh, in the early 2000s, but the things she sees are pretty easily, I think, um, extrapolated to other dioceses and other, other denominations. So she goes through a whole bunch of criticisms <laughs> of the way the church operates, structures, values, um, the whole thing. And blow by blow basically suggests that the church is not just fading away, but is actually suicidal. It's actually making the wrong decisions at every step. <laughs> so it's a, it's a terrifying read. People who like Stephen King maybe can switch over to uh, <laughs> Caroline Miley. She quotes the English philosopher Margaret Sunville and she says, modern society is multicultural, pluralistic, individualistic, my emphasis, secular, 
postmodern, post-materialist. I'm assuming these are things that have come up in your other units thus far, probably even today, I would imagine. She says, while we, while we know who we were and what we used to believe in, we don't know who we are and what we believe in now. This is the church she's talking about. This leaves us with a historically unprecedented lack of identity and sense of purpose. In fact, there's probably youth wider than the church here. Historically unprecedented lack of identity and sense of purpose. Okay, it's pretty strong stuff. Then Caroline Miley quotes Richard Eckersley, who's like a, a social scientist and um, from the National Centre for Epidemiology and Population Health. There remains thousands of young people for whom alienation from family and community, mistrust of institutions and a pervasive sense of disillusion are common experiences. Anywhere between about a fifth and a third of young people may be currently depressed Anywhere from up to two thirds have thought about suicidal thoughts of some sort in the past 12 months. At least to the extent of thinking that life is so bad that they feel like giving up or that life just isn't worth living. Well, that's 2001, but I'm sure you're aware that Australian teen suicide rates are dreadful. They're very high. And uh, it's often worth just pausing and just wondering why that is. Why is this happening in Australia? sometimes called the lucky country, ironically or not. So much going for us, high standard of living, etc., etc. seems to tick all those boxes, and yet we've got young people with a lot of rates of depression, anxiety, stress, etc., and in fact suicidal tendencies and, and so on. So we're gonna to need to, to, to think about these things. Okay, on a slightly different note, <laughs> before we get too down, I'll just show you the start of uh, one of my favourite movies, which I hope works for us this time. Then I've got to go, then I've got to do this. I've got to do this, I hope. There you go. Yep. Just waiting for this to go, come on. Oops. Me around him. Paris, Mr. Merrick. I'm gonna catch Bill, yeah, I'm gonna beat some kids. And you know? Oh, boy. 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 Oh
okie dokie, so just give me a call, let me know. Bye! For those of you going on to college next year, the chance of finding a good job will actually decrease by the time you graduate. The available number of entry-level jobs will drop 31% over the next four years. Median income for those jobs will go down as well. Obviously, my friends, it's a competitive world. And good grades are your only ticket through. In fact, by the year 2000... The of contracting HIV from a non-monogamous lifestyle will climb to 1 in 150. The odds of dying in an auto accident are only 1 in 2,500. Now this marks a drastic increase. From 14 years ago, when ozone depletion was at just 10% of its current level. By the time you are 30 years old, average global temperature will have risen 2.5 degrees, causing such catastrophic consequences as typhoons, floods, widespread drought, and famine. Okay, who can tell me what famine is? Honey, I'm home. Hello, darling. How was your day? Oh, swell. You know, Mr. Connell says if things keep going the way they are, I might be seeing that promotion sooner than I thought. Oh, darling, that's wonderful. I always knew you could do it. Hey, Pumpkin, what's that smell? Is that your meatloaf? It might be. It might be. Oh, Pumpkin. <laughs> You sure know the way to this man's heart. No, no, that was not the deal. No, you have custody first weekend of every month. This is the first weekend. No, I'm not going to bail you out. I'm going out of town this weekend. La Costa. Mary, if I want to have a mud bath with my new boyfriend, that's really my business, isn't it? Hey, where are those Excuse kids? Excuse me? Right behind, you, right behind you, father. Right behind you, father. Mother, father, Bud has a little surprise for you. What's that, Bud? First place in the science fair. There were lots of swell projects. I guess mine was just the swellest. Darling, that's wonderful, except there's no such word as swellest. Well, gee whiz, Mom. It wasn't the English fair. <laughs> no, that's not the point. The point is, you're supposed to see them. Fine, fine, fine. See them another time. What's a mother to do? What's a mother to do? Okie <laughs> dokie. Alrighty. Okay, yep. Super. Okay. Let's do this together, I think. <laughs> be alright. So, as you can see, the movie Pleasantville, who, has anyone hasn't seen it? Okay, it's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> it's a terrific movie. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a lot deeper than it may appear. But essentially what's happening is that... I'm just going to show that for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Bud, the... Uh, oh, not Bud, but the, um, uh, the main male lead that you see there uh, is obviously an expert on Pleasantville. He's watched every episode. And uh, so he wins a competition about knowing Pleasantville trivia and stuff like that, or he's keen to stay home and be part of this competition. But one thing leads to another, and he and his sister actually end up in the Pleasantville world. So they're sucked into this world, and it's all about what happens there. There's a lot more to it, uh, which I won't go into today. But for, uh, for those five minutes of things that you just saw, question one, what are some points of contrast you saw? So there's the Pleasantville world, which is essentially the 1950s, and then there's like... Idealized. The modern world of now. Can we just look at some points of contrast? So, what did you see Family described values. in the Pleasantville world? Say again. Family values. Yep. Mm. Uh, and compared to what today? Uh, very <laughs> slack or non-existent. <laughs> All right, it's slack or. Oh, or a dis dysfunctional. No parents. Like dysfunctional. The, the yep. Divorce, kind of separated, not yes. wanting to see. Yes. Did you see what the real life mother was? on the phone about, did you yeah, catch yeah, that? Custody. Right, custody. so custody, right, trying to get out of, trying to get out of looking after the children for the weekend, etc. Yeah, whereas in the Pleasant Hill you know, it was a married couple and the husband went to work and yep. the wife was at home. And she greeted him with a gin and tonic when he came up. Whoa. Uh, he come I'm on. sorry, dude. With the hair and makeup. Yeah, and the pot roast. I've never had yeah. it happen, that's why I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Okay, so pretty obviously um, the gender roles. The well, that's right, gender roles, traditional family, etc. Traditional gender roles. Mm -hmm. Yep. Feel free to write these down because mm -hmm. I won't be. Uh, <laughs> I could be relying on another Jonathan Sargent photo. Gender roles. Okay, how could we contrast this to what you see in the in the modern world in that case? Was there any obvious dad in the picture in the, mm -hmm. in the modern one? No, there is no dad within it. Or he is, but he's on the phone. So no dad yeah, not at particularly home. interested in custody. And he's not very interested in being a dad. This not particular thing. Yeah. That's right. Um, I think, well, I, and I think that's probably a separate point in its own, like, um, yep. so interest in what your kids are doing. So yep. in the 1950s clip, that you know, right. I want to, I want it the science fair. Right. Um, versus. Good point. They're trying to palm him off onto each right. other that really care. So the parents are actually talking to the kids and vice versa. Yep. Interested talking parents, all right, and there appears to be no or not much. Let's say, let's say limited. Limited communication between them. Yep. I think the other one I picked up was like uh, more like an esteem. Like so, in the 1950s, kids they were very up and bubbly and like uh, peachy keen and uh, cool. he, you what. yeah. And the clip yep. on the the kids in the schoolyard. We'll come to that one sec. Yeah. Yep. You may we'll not come agree. To that one sec. The overall feeling I got is between the two 1950s, very fake. <laughs> it sounds like a, hi, well, I'm happy. I feel like. Okay, well let's let's go with that. So let's go, yeah, okay. I mean that's fair enough. Within the world of Pleasantville, hence the name, you know, everything is pleasant. Mm. So everything is happy or pleasant, as opposed to the contrasted day where everything is kind of chaotic and a bit weird. Well, I would have put um, 1950s fake and now realistic. Well, okay, I'll, I'll take your point. I'll that just say one more thing. also kind of contrasted TV show with reality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you notice something about the occupations? Who, who, who's working at, yeah. in the night? In Dad was working. And Dad, Dad works outside the home. And his chances of promotion were good. That's right. <laughs> Mum's at home. than expected. Yeah. And then the teacher was there saying, you know, there's not going to be any jobs for you and mm. wages mm. are going to go yeah. down. Yeah. Mm. Oh, That's yeah. Right. That would probably tie into that last point, that chaotic, sad kind yes, of... Yes, that's right. Doom and the, gloom. So, doom and gloom stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yes. And the thing about who can tell you what famine is? Have a big smile, etc. All right. Yes. Nice work. Okay. Let's go to healthy nutrition. Oh yes. Have another cookie. About meals. That's quite right. So the food stuff does come up in the rest of the movie a couple of times uh, because they make the point that inside Pleasantville, no one ever gets fat. So you basically eat everything you like. I mean, they uh, down to breakfast, like pancakes, waffles, yep. ham steaks, bacon, the whole thing covered in maple syrup, and eggs. Okay. And <laughs> okay, so just quickly then, representations. So even when the film is then going into the real world of today, what things did you notice? Did you catch any images of real life youth? The kids all seemed bored and apathetic. Yes, they were sort of sleeping or uh, lying down or... What is it? Uh, yes. Yep, we get a big shot of a uh, tongue piercing in one of the first bits. Yep. Yep. General general appearance. Think about compared to the two kids in Scruffy. Scruffy. Yep. Scruffy. Yep. Got their stuff, yeah. Almost slovenly. And certainly very casual to say the least. But yeah, I think they're meant to look kind of scruffy and everything else. That's there, okay? And yet these are meant to be sort of the real the real kids of today, contrasted with Pleasantville. Very nice. Okay, good work. So that is the world of Pleasantville. Uh, I do encourage you to, to watch it if you ever get a chance. It's um, really good. That's great. So how did we get to here from there is the question. And I think that's, um, I think that is a shot from the 50s and I think that is actually a real family, although pretty obviously staged nonetheless. Okay. Well, these are some notes taken from the Philip Hughes reading that's on your, uh, the sheet. So there's a few things here. So these are the sorts of things you may well have been covering so far, but we'll, we'll build them into the picture. So what's, what are some of the things that have changed since the 1960s? Well, Philip Hughes argues that there's a decline in local community life. And he defines that in a couple of ways. He says that the fact that there's more women in the workforce since World War II, etc., and that women are more mobile, therefore, getting out and about, and everything means there's less local activity. 
Um, he doesn't say this, my comment in square brackets. Uh, there's a number of primary schools I know today which are really struggling to get people, mums or dads, to fill the tuck shop roster. So a lot of primary schools are saying they're going to have to either close down their tuck shops or just not offer it as many days as some others because they say they simply cannot find anyone who's available to come and do a few hours at school during the week. Um, I, think that is, I think that is likely. Um, just wonder if you'd do a very quick exercise for me. Think about the street you grew up in. Think about the house you lived the longest in. I hope there is such a thing. I want you to draw a very quick little map on your page of the street where you grew up and just see if you can name the people who lived in your neighbourhood around you, just the nearest houses. Do you reckon you can do it? Um, yeah. Probably one either way. Okay. Across the road to the left. I'll give you 60 right. seconds to do your best. Go. Just draw a little <laughs> mud map of the area you grew up. Who lived where? Okay, once you've got some names, if you've got some names from those people, see if you can remember any connections that you had with them besides just being neighbours. Did you have any other connections with them? Were there kids who went to the same school? Did you have any other common interests or anything else? Uh, did they go to the same church or anything like that? Okay, next to that I want you to draw your street today where you're living now. How many neighbours can you name? Ooh. Draw another little mud map. <laughs> Just pick again the, the nearest few houses if that's uh, if that's the easiest thing to do. I live in a rectory. There's no neighbours. Yep. I live in a townhouse complex and I don't know anyone else. <laughs> well, just write that down. Just write question marks as to who these people are. Or write down notes. I mean, you must have seen oh, them. Oh, I know one one of the kids in the complex. His well, name is Bailey. Good. <laughs> his dad's always been Bailey. Bailey. Write down! Do you know where he lives? Yeah. Okay, write him in. <laughs> I know the office staff for St. Lawrence's Church. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's probably not quite what we're going for here, but that's all right. So you've got no other neighbours anywhere nearby? The St. Lawrence's takes up the yeah. whole block. Okay. So yeah. okay. There's across the road that I would know. Right, yeah, I'm not very familiar with it, I must admit. I must get up there. <laughs> all right. So how are we doing? Just compare your work with your neighbour and explain your mud map to them. Right. Which one is the one you grew up in? Yes, okay, so it right. means you know their names. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. And did you have any other connections with them so through anything? Yeah, just neighbours. Yeah, they're growing up. Um, right in both situations, just neighbours. Yeah, okay. they never really knew anyone. Right? All right. Well, and what about today? For us a bit. Do you know, do you know, you know just... Me, and I only know two of yeah, so right. I've tried to meet this lady, um, she doesn't want to know me. Okay. I've tried I've to meet this person, yeah. they're like, she went to the <laughs> avoid me. <laughs> 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 These people, right. I, can't, I don't know their name, but Sebastian um, yeah, introduced so himself in the first right. couple of weeks we were there. Cool. Um, these um, guys are rev heads and live up on top of the hill. Yeah, so now, okay. These guys don't want to know church, me. This girl, every time she sees me, she runs in the other direction because I reported them for domestic violence. Okay. And these people, I know these people are related. Like these. These people are like um, mother and like in some kind of way. Okay. Alright, and what have you got? That's the three day group. Yeah. Now everybody. Um, to do their building, so we... Well, weird ones. Yep. Well, and, well, and, they know I don't them. know the name. And, and um, they have a poodle. Yeah, <laughs> so good. Have you got any connections? Did you have any connections besides no, I think, the neighbours? I think George uh, went through one of the greenways that had the top of their greenways. One of the kids. Oh, nice. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's and, uh, okay, uh, all right. And what about today? And today, we live in a townhouse complex. There's about 50 houses. Yeah, I reckon you know almost anybody else. 
I know yes. Bailey's name because the yeah, yeah, name of the parents are always shouting out. Yeah. And oh, I have right. spoken to oh, our yeah. direct neighbour. Yep. So that yeah. was like over a year okay. ago. Okay. Sure. I don't know. Wow. I don't know All right. Name. All right. Well, thanks, folks. Um, what did you make of that? Was anybody surprised by? My guess is you're going to say in the 1960s everyone knew everybody. Um, you'd be you'd be correct, um, <laughs> but it's it is you who say so. Um, so. Um, I must admit, when I did this exercise, it just came to me uh, as I was sort of preparing this um, unit, and it just came to me to think about the street where I grew up in. I must admit, to my surprise, I actually got a little emotional. Um, I didn't actually draw a map, but I mentally went up and down the street, and I realised that, in fact, probably because of my mum being a stay-at-home mum, possibly, was part of it, but possibly because of the, the times, um, I could name everyone in, in the street up and down. Now of those probably roughly say six houses on our side, six houses on the other side, um, that's 12, I would say at a rough guess five houses remain, the rest have been demolished including the house I grew up in very recently for units. Um, and there's, no, there's, to the best of my knowledge, no, none of those residents are there. But then when I think about connections, uh, at least one other person in the, that group went to church with me and several sets of kids went to primary school with me and so we would get together and play games and stuff like that from time to time. Um, in my current street, uh, there has been some turnover recently, but we actually did pretty well to know other people in our street. But there's no doubt from what you say, and just generally speaking, this is a very small sample, but you would agree that there does seem to be this lack of understanding of neighbours and thus you, thus you hear these stories about little old ladies who uh, die and are alone in their house for two weeks before anyone notices, etc., etc. They're pretty appalling stories, but you know, maybe this is part of what we're talking about. Um, yeah. Comments? Oh, just in terms of like the decline in local community. So one of my friends um, is the only one to be a stay-at-home mum. She's mm -hmm. had three kids. Yep. Uh, her youngest is like six months old and she we were reflecting on you know because she's coming to the end of now having children um, and she was saying you know I thought I actually thought it would be different um, I had this idea that I would have you know lots of friends would come over mm. and and we would you know I would be at home with the kids and there would be this network of people in my area mm. and she said it just hasn't happened mm. like I keep waiting for it I've been waiting for four years but it just hasn't happened and I was like oh wow and I think that's because for her when she was growing up that's what happened with her mum but that's like 30 years ago sure two years ago some people in our street moved in uh, a few doors up and they then proceeded to say, send around a message saying, okay, street party for Christmas at our place. Kaboom. <laughs> the beautiful thing was, only the people who wanted to be sociable came along. So people actually wanted to meet other people on the street, came along and met. Uh, an old couple came out of a house up the street who I hadn't met. Uh, they'd been there since 62, when the street was basically created. Uh, they pulled out laminated photos of the street in 1962, the street, you know, recently, etc., etc. It was fascinating for all kinds of reasons. But there was that, you know, there was the goodwill that was there. The people who didn't want to socialise didn't come. <laughs> so it worked out. But it was a remarkable kind of event uh, to have. And it did make me think deeply about these things. Okay, we must push along. I think today you heard more about the use of technology and so on. Okay, so phones and the internet and so on. Uh, Phil Hughes makes some points about television. So with the advent of television, you've got more people staying home rather than going to cinemas or going to clubs, etc. Uh, TV watching means that people are taking more of a national and a global interest rather than just staying with local news and gossip and stuff like that. 
and he base and he then argues that uh, watching TV news and watching TV dramas encourages you to see the world as a dramatic place where the unexpected is going to happen, and you should expect the unexpected, and so on. And his argument is that this creates a kind of a sense of chaos uh, within you. Okay, that's his argument. Importantly, he then gets into individualism. And he's got an interesting argument, which is that the, the child-rearing practices have something to do with this. So as there's less infant mortality as the decades go by, you would think that that would lead to a greater number of children in a family. He says, in fact, the opposite happens. So whereas in the past, a family might have had like seven, eight, nine kids, because they basically reckoned that they would lose two or three through infant mortality. Once that risk is gone, people start saying, okay, we don't need to have as many kids. And thus you have smaller kids and so on, uh, smaller numbers of kids that are there. And there's much more to it. But essentially this idea of having smaller families then relates to individualism. I'll show you more why in a sec. Okay, you've got more women with careers outside home. That's also meaning smaller families and so on, or fewer children. Smaller families means that there's greater individual attention to each child. This is a nice argument. So in larger families, where there was like, you know, a decade or more between them, kids would get assigned roles, okay? You are the eldest son, you, you're doing this. You are the eldest daughter or whoever. Right, you kids, you're looking after those kids, etc. <laughs> All right? Mm -hmm. And once you lose that sorts of jobs and they become redundant, then you get people, and particularly those middle kids, basically saying, well, what about my needs now? Because there's only a couple of us. So we get this, uh, this new self-perception amongst kids in the family. They've now got the parental attention span, because there's, say, only two or three of them. Uh, they can actually express their wishes and feel that it's okay that they have their needs and wishes met because there's less competition with siblings on either side. It's a nice argument, okay? So it's this idea of the, uh, the Marsha, Marsha, Marsha effect. Um, where you might recall the episode where Jan, the middle daughter, is complaining that the eldest daughter always gets all the attention and she doesn't get any attention with the number of kids that are there. Anyway, you can watch that episode on YouTube sometime. But I guess that's part of the argument, okay? Philip Hughes then uh, uses this idea about just a changing worldview and changing times. So whereas in the past, people had pretty much thought the world was like a closed system and things just ran in machine-like fashion and everyone had a job to do and you just did your job and the world just kept going the way it was meant to be going. This has changed dramatically and so now the world is seen as a maze of competing powers. It's a web. It's like a, it's like a computer game and he uses that analogy a few times. It's like a computer game where you never know where the next bullet's coming from so you better be ready for it, whatever it is. And he says instead of asking what's good for the nation or the system, people start asking what's good for me? They saw themselves as faced with a multitude of choices, and this thing about options and choices is very important. This comes up again and again. Multitude of choices or options, giving them opportunity to find good experiences and find personal satisfaction. And again, that's my capitals there, okay? And it's about the new importance of feelings in decision making. So it's less about duty and uh, respect for institutions and so on. It's more about what's in it for me, what about my needs? I've only got one life, life is short. I need to meet those things now while I can, etc. And this thing about personal rights, again, coming up, okay? So specifically in talking about faith and church life, which he then goes into, he says that there's a sense where uh, church goes increasingly are wanting an intimate experience rather than, rather than reverence of things that are there. He says you see less formality with social classes and titles. And I think this is again interesting as well. So if you watch those shows about past decades, you always call your boss by, you know, Mr. Kemp, or whoever it is. Uh, <laughs> so I just call it. It's got a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Uh, uh, Mr. Kemp, the, uh, uh, the boss. So this idea of going in and calling your boss, or whoever it is, particularly if they're high, way higher up the chain, by a first name or something. John O. Yes, so, so, it's really, um, even, I must admit I struggle with it, um, myself from time to time. So this notion even of calling bishops or the archbishop by their first names, uh, I struggle with it, even though I see people around me doing it. 
Um, I've even had Bishop Cameron, you know, essentially say, call me Cam. <laughs> um, I struggle. I really struggle to do that. Um, but I, I appreciate the intent behind it. Um, but it's interesting there's been this shift, you know. It's a little shift. And Phil Hughes makes the point that often with this social change, it's these little increments that happen. And so because it's a bit here and a bit there, you don't really notice it. But just over time, you've suddenly got massive social change and people start wondering how it happened. Mm. So I thought that was interesting. Now, needless to say, Australians are the people who embrace this and claim that we're a massively egalitarian society. Mm. And I've said to classes before, you know, if you met the Prime Minister or the Premier or someone, do you reckon you could call them by their first name? Well, some people say yes, some people say no. And say, yeah, oh yeah, that's okay. <laughs> All right, I'm sure people do call premiers and prime ministers by their first names or governors or whoever, but again, I would struggle, but maybe younger people would not struggle to do that. Yeah, so it's the idea of younger people wanting a relationship with God based on intimacy more than just respect for the institution and so on. The argument is that young people value honesty and authenticity rather than respect and awe. So you say you're a bishop, so what? <laughs> Impress me, you know? Oh, you're doing fantastic work. It was a great sermon and, you know, You've made God sort of clearer to me in some way. Okay, now I'm now I'm I'm with you. Now I like you and respect you, etc. That's I'm, I'm I'm exaggerating, but that's the kind of idea. All right. He makes the point about dressing for church. So uh, you'll see your oldies at church wearing suit and tie, um, wearing hats and pearls and gloves and stuff like that. Maybe <laughs> um, younger people. Well, I've seen people with no shoes on and stuff like that. You know. And what's the thinking? God doesn't care what I'm wearing in church. You know, God just wants me to be me. Um, sort of St. Francis of Assisi stuff. You know, I'll just wander in as I am. What's wrong with that? You know? Okay. And this idea again of personal rather than positional authority. So just because you've got a rank supposedly, so what? You've got to prove yourself. I want to see power, not just authority. This means that clergy can't expect automatic respect for being clergy people. Sadly. Sorry, sorry formation students, um, those things of the past have disappeared for a couple of reasons. And in fact, the argument is that the same goes for God. God doesn't get respect just because he's God. <laughs> Does anybody know what this is? Close. Yes. Nice it's idea. going up to heaven. Yes, that's God up the top. World order. It's like it's God and heaven and the kings and the nobles. Yes, and yes. This is the famous... Uh, comes up in Shakespeare a fair amount because it's a sort of a uh, renaissance idea, the great chain of being. So this is an idea put out that God is there at the top. Where are those a pointer? No, okay. Uh, God is up the top there on the throne. Jesus the Son is nearby. If you look really carefully here, you'll see the dove representing the Holy Spirit sort of on God the Father's chest up there, yeah. okay? And then you've got Mother Mary off to one side and so on, basically looking on. So you've got God and up the top, the triune God. Then you've got basically upper angels, lower angels, saints, and then the various classes, and then animals, and then vegetables, <laughs> and so on, all the way down. Okay? And this is the idea at these times, that this rank is absolutely the way the universe works. Okay? Cast, cast that's it. Okay? And there is absolutely no changing that. It is this order, and that's it. Um, and so you will be at your rank because, full stop, that's just the way it is. And you see this replicated in different parts of life. Well, the fact that you and I <laughs> uh, have no idea about the great chain of being in detail tells us that this idea is gone. You know, it is no longer of any consequence whatsoever. And we just sort of laugh at this outdated notion from the media, Middle Ages and thereabouts. So a few more ideas from Philip Hughes. It's all about feelings rather than a conception of such. There's less sense of duty to attend church amongst younger people than older generations would say, okay? You look at your older generation sometimes, these oldies coming to church every week, okay? <laughs> Be most unusual if they missed a week. It's absolutely locked in. On Sunday morning, between this hour and this hour, I will be at that parish doing church. And it's absolutely, you know, rusted on and stuff. It's almost if they're not, then it's because they're sick or in hospital. Correct. Or and people say, different. where's that person? <laughs> Etc. Okay. There's an argument, and I'll agree with it, and you can agree or disagree. 
that younger people will attend church to the extent they find it enjoyable, personally satisfying and meaningful. The notion of a young person saying, well, I must be at that particular church in that particular pew between that particular time, no matter what, because it's my duty to do that. It's not impossible someone might hold that view out there, but it's, it'd be unusual for a younger generation. I think you'll agree. There is less allegiance to one church. Um, there's more mobility, particularly once you get your license. Sure, well, where am I going to go? The notion now of being on one side of town, going to church on the other side, or a few suburbs away, very commonplace, not at all a problem. In the past, this would have been unusual. You'd go to your local church. If things in your local church weren't the way you wanted them, maybe you'd stay and work for change. But these days it's more like, uh, too much hard stuff. I'll just go to this other church where I think things are more my style, etc. Um, when they did the National Church Life Survey, and they started exploring which denominations people were attached to and so on and what that was all about, they discovered that this thing about denominational allegiance was very, very flexible. So really, they called it the Protestant supermarket as a nickname. So basically, if you're a Catholic, yeah, you're stuck with the Catholic Church. <laughs> you're, you're, you're gonna go to a Catholic Church and probably the local one and so on, and that it tends to be the culture. But they showed a lot more flexibility amongst Protestants so the idea of growing up Anglican but going to a Baptist church or a Hillsong or whatever, or Uniting Church or Lutheran or whatever, generally speaking, it tends to be a bit of shopping around for whatever's there. And you'll agree with me, it's not at all uncommon to meet someone who's been part of three different Protestant denominations uh, over the course of their life. So there's no guarantees of long-term loyalty. All aspects of worship, including sermons, tend to be evaluated by the young in terms of how it makes me feel rather than what I learned today. You may, you may choose to think that that's a, a touch overstated from Philip Hughes. That's your call. Um, I think some people I know, young people, will actually come away with a very good understanding of what was good about the sermon in terms of what they've learned and so on. But for a lot of people, it's about, well, was I challenged today? Um, do I feel happier having come to church? If I leave church feeling more miserable than I was when I arrived, well, there's a couple of things that could happen. <laughs> One is, maybe, something touched aspects of your life that you're not happy with, and you'll go and deal with those. Alternatively, you'll go, oh, yeah, I didn't like that. I'm going to go somewhere else. <laughs> um, I was listening today by a song called Steve Taylor, which I decided not to inflict upon you. Uh, a bit of 80s Christian rock. Uh, you can go and look it up sometime. Uh, there's a song by Steve Taylor I used to like a lot of the time called Steeplechase and some of the lines are things like uh, uh, you like the big church because it's easy not to get involved um, then you uh, then you went to the little church but yeah it was too it was too it was too involving but then you went back to the big church and it was too big and you got lost in the crowd and stuff like that and it goes on like this someone's written in the comments on YouTube this this song could have been written yesterday um, yeah, Steve Taylor's going to Easter Fest to my amazement, but interesting. Pushing along, same for music and so on. Okay, and without divulging conferences, at our Young Adult Retreat recently, we had a little forum about the Anglican Church, and one of the comments that came up from a Young Adult participant was about the language of the Anglican Church service. Essentially, you know, why does it have to be the same words every week? And why does it have to be words we don't understand? And so on. Um, this is a fair question, I think. And I think each generation must ask the question and hopefully find some answers to them and so on. When you can argue that the Anglican, one of the foundations was to worship in the local Book of language. Common Prayer. Oh, well, that too. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. And Common Prayer. Like, yes. how do you balance Common Prayer versus yep. local language? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> the challenge is, is we haven't done enough to explain why. Yeah. Why we do it like that? Yeah. We haven't talked about kind of the theology of liturgy and worship yeah. and so on enough so that people understand what the language is and what the. So and not going to disagree. Do it the same way every time. Yeah. Yeah. And if there are words there that have just simply dropped out of the language, you know, do we really need to use that particular word, etc.? Yeah. Anyway, it's a much bigger yeah. topic. Yeah. Much, and, much and, bigger topic. And those people, like after they had had certain things explained to them, they went, "Oh, really?" Like Absolutely. things like, "Oh, okay, I didn't realize that, that everybody, sense now. you know, yeah. it uses this common prayer, but we didn't realize yes. it was there." So you like that. Yeah. There's much more to be said yeah. <laughs> about that. We'll push along. Okay. This idea of 
liking ad hoc groups rather than institutions, that young people can be suspicious of institutions and denominations. Um, whereas the older generations really like this idea of subcommittees, minutes, uh, you know, uh, who reports to whom, etc., etc. Younger people tend to be more interested in getting rid of the paperwork, just forming the group to get something done, and we go and do it, okay? And we do that as efficiently as possible. They might say, if worship's about God and me, why bring the church into it? And thus you see cell groups, house churches, etc., all forming. I think that's all right. Okay. Any other comments or questions on this sort of stuff? Is this sounding kind of rightish? Yeah, I think Philip Hughes has pretty much nailed most of that. There are always going to be exceptions. And whenever you're doing this sort of social or cultural analysis, yeah. there's always exceptions to any particular group that you've got. Okay. So Hughes is saying, in terms of individualism now, today's emphasis is often upon one's personal relationship with God with less emphasis on mediating that through community. Faith communities can be good for strengthening individual faith. That's why you get together. But if the community stops doing that, it is increasingly likely that your parishioners are going to walk. <laughs> They're going to walk away and go find somewhere else where they feel more comfortable for whatever reason. To sum it up, he says, God is not the problem for young people typically, but the institutional nature of the church is. That's, that's the issue. Okay. So that was Philip Hughes. The other reading I've included in the unit is this one by Richard Rice from Loma Linda University in California, The Challenge of Spiritual Individualism, that you can find. Now, Richard Rice is from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, so a bit of what he says is from a Seventh-day Adventist kind of point of view, but very largely it is a pretty mainstream approach. So he says this individualism issue in terms of the church has two particular forms. One is the conviction that religious beliefs are matters of personal preference, able to be mixed like a salad. Has anyone met someone who um, said something like, uh, I'm a big Christian but also a bit Buddhist, or something like that? Has anyone met someone like this? <laughs> I certainly have. Has anyone met anyone else who had a particularly weird kind of uh, smorgasbordy approach to their religious beliefs? Um, the, the most common one I, I come across is um, I, I believe in God but I don't go to church or I believe in God and I don't think you need to believe in God to go to church. Absolutely. To to church to believe in God. Absolutely. Yep, that's a very common one. In fact, it's <laughs> related to this one. The conviction that religion is essentially a private matter. It's all about inner experience and religious goals may be pursued entirely on your own. So this is the thing about, again, you know, there's God, there's me, what else do I need? Okay? Oh, yeah, maybe I need a Bible, maybe I need something else. But by and large, you know, that's the way it's going to work. So he says, spiritual individualism, these are the two challenges, uh, and we must address them. Uh, has anyone seen that second one? Maybe that is this thing about being spiritual but not religious. There's a bit of that. I'm thinking of them in terms of media. The first one makes me think of Life of Pi, where the main yep. characters. Christian, Hindu, and Muslim. Yes. And the second one is that episode of The Simpsons where Homer decides not to go to church. And that's that conversation with God saying, Yes. I can be Christian. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. Good examples. Yep. Okay. So. Now he's writing from America, but would you agree that these sound Australian as well? <laughs> yes, it's funny, isn't it? Uh, I met a lady at a party one time who came up and was kind of interested in what I do, and then she said, I'm a Buddhist. And, you know, she clearly didn't look particularly Buddhist, whatever that looks like. Uh, and I said to her, so, um, okay, and how do you do this or something, rather? And, uh, and she said, I just think Buddhism just covers it all. It's just got all the answers. Um, and I said, okay, so what about reincarnation and, and so on? Oh, no, I don't believe that bit. <laughs> right, okay. So, all right. I guess it shows that not just Christians being sort of pickers and choosers, yeah. but maybe in today's world you've got, you know, pick and choose Buddhists, pick and choose Hindus, etc. And it does make you wonder about uh, all these issues about the institution. Uh, how, do you, how do you take hold of someone and know that they're on the same field as you, and does that matter? Um, I think that's interesting. In opposition to that, in a way, can anyone come up with examples of where you've seen a church act with integrity or speak with authenticity? 
about something. Maybe a maybe a <laughs> not one. <laughs> maybe it, maybe it, maybe if not a church, what about a particular Christian uh, figure that you feel put their faith uh, up front and actually counteracted some of these matters? Have you seen someone stand up for their their Christian beliefs in a consistent kind of way? I'm wondering whether to be worried if we haven't. I don't know. I've had this question asked in different ways a lot lately. Okay. <laughs> and the one that seems to keep coming up is the Love Way Makes a Way movement. Oh. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, okay. has been ecumenical, but it's Christian leaders stand up and say, you know, Christian leaders prepared to be arrested serious. for their beliefs, etc., yeah. um, by making a non violent protest. And connecting what our faith is teaching us with a real issue. Yep. Okay, good. Yep. Uh, I think of uh, Desmond Tutu with the, uh, the, um, the Board for National Reconciliation Commission in uh, South Africa after the end of apartheid, etc. Uh, challenging stuff. And there are, of course, Christian martyrs of all times and ages of various kinds. Some people would look at Dietrich Bonhoeffer or, or others like that. Um, and people putting religion out in public. Yeah, there's a guy called Scott Cowdell, you may know. Uh, in fact, I just saw his picture up on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Scott Cadell from formerly of Brisbane, he's in Canberra now and he's written quite a few books. One of his from a few years ago now is called God's Next Big Thing, Discovering the Future Church, so I'll be referring to that a bit this time and next time as well. I'm sure there's a copy upstairs as well. It's pretty readable, pretty readable. Looks a bit, of, again, of cultural analysis, where the church is, where the church could be or should be, etc. He makes an interesting comment at one point where he says, um, the church just needs to get out there a bit more, be more visible and more known for what it's doing, etc. Well, I don't think anyone's going to disagree with that. He makes a, a point at one stage where he says Christians, this is going to be controversial, he says uh, Christians should have sex in public. Now, he doesn't actually mean go and be an exhibitionist. <laughs> You'll be happy to know. But basically what he's saying is um, uh, if Christians are saying that our, our sex lives are actually influenced by our faith, etc., and that things happen or don't happen because of faith, shouldn't everyone know about that? You know, shouldn't that be itself a sort of a witness? And he refers to all sorts of other aspects of life as well, where Christians should be actually just being a bit more public about why we do what we do. Um, I think that's a, that's a good argument, and he makes a, a lot more of that. Would that connect with the love book makes a way thing then too? Yep, this that's is a it. practical thing that society yep. is talking about and wrestling with, and this is how yeah. Christians raises interesting questions about um, the church, media and so on, you know. Uh, does it take a, a Christian to get arrested, to get, a, to get up into the headlines for doing some particular uh, Christian act? Um, is, that, is that what it comes down to? Well, there's also the uh, a progressive Christian voice was saying we're sick of this one viewpoint being the only representation mm. of Christianity in the mm. media. Yes, indeed. So, mm -hmm. you know, Sure. We and need to be out there talking about this in public. Mm -hmm. And they were the uh, sort of launch for a fairly well known, jour known journalist writing a series of articles on um, domestic yep. violence yeah. and the church's response to that. That's it. Um, yep. That's cool. so Absolutely. Not interested, but mm. being visible. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, the gospel has got a few headlines from its signs. As That's well. true. That's true. The gospel uh, billboards outside the church and so mm. on. Okay, we're very nearly there. Um, just in terms now of responding to the challenge. So here's individualism, here's how it's affecting people. Well, how can the church respond to that? And so on. So this is Richard Rice in America. He says a few things, and I'll just go through this pretty quickly because you've done really well today. Clarify the nature of Christian community. What is it, what is it that makes a church special, a faith community? And he uses all the Bible readings, which I haven't listed here, but you can probably tell me what they are yourselves, but they're all listed there as well. You know, Acts, Galatians, Ephesians, Corinthians, it's all there. What is the nature of our Christian community? We can share, we suffer together, we serve each other, we forgive each other, etc. This is special, this is unique, and that is something that's valuable. He says, emphasize the relationship between salvation and the church. Salvation by faith, as Paul explains, repeatedly, he says, provides the basis of a radically inclusive community. So against this idea, we're not Jews, we're not Greeks, we're not slaves, we're not free, we're all one. 
etc. And there is something here in what we have as a church if we're doing those things that is a radical picture to the world, a radical picture. Now, I've seen Anglican writers like Jesse Zink make this point repeatedly about Anglicans around the world. We're almost uniquely positioned to show to the world how it is possible to be diverse and yet coexist if we have the will to do that. And I think there is something there. That's an interesting point. Find effective ways to portray the church, and again, in positive ways. Okay? The sort of things we've been talking about, basically. Find ways to cultivate community, the sense of community. Avoid individualism. Affirm individuality. Nothing wrong with being an individual. That's okay. You know? That's absolutely all right. Everyone's got their own particular set of skills, gifts, etc. That's a completely biblical, reasonable Christian concept. But it's this idea of individualism. Individuality says affirms the value of the person. Individualism exaggerates and undermines it. Because you're basically saying, I am more important than all these other people. It's my needs, not community needs, etc. There is a difference there. Yeah, and he says, and I think this is a nice one. We need to replace individualism with individuality in community. I like that. Individuality in community. And I guess people would say, well, that is church. Okay. Very nearly there. Back to Philip Hughes just briefly then. So to summarise how he's seeing the changes, the ways we express our faith are at least to some extent a product of the culture in which we live. The recent individualism of faith may have roots in changes in child-rearing practices, like the size of families and so on. The decline of a social hierarchy is reflected in less sense of reverence among young people, but perhaps more sense of intimacy. Faith itself is not just a product of our culture, but culture influences the way we see God, traditions, the Bible, etc. Culture itself is always in flux, and we can learn to evaluate it and shape it just as much as we can be affected by it. So on a positive note to end, Back to, um, back to uh, Caroline Miley in the Suicidal Church. It's not all bad news. <laughs> she would argue that surveys have shown, shouldn't be a braggart, that religiosity and belief in the moral order are actually factors protecting against depression and drug use among young people. So there is something good about being Christian, being part of a church community. Um, it can actually help you be happier and uh, have a more stable life. I think that's okay. Is that, is that from like the... Uh, protective and risk factors on for mental health? Is that where you got that? Yes, yes, I think so. I can show you that, that clip. I think they went around speaking to grade nine students and basically assessing what were the factors that seemed to more likely dispose someone towards depression, drug use, etc., or or not. So amongst the group that said that they had religiosity, belief in the moral order, and were able to express that, that group was overwhelmingly less likely to be involved in drug abuse and depression and so on after that, okay? And a nice quote, she says, the church is uniquely placed to lead, to reinsert meaning into the lives of a generation that suffers from its lack. Uniquely placed because it is the recipient of the revelation of the way, the truth and the life. It is in fact the only body that can reinsert this meaning into contemporary life. So today we've looked at individualism Next time we'll look at globalism and consumerism and see how they all mesh together into this modern world and how we can respond to each part of that. Okay? Thanks very much for your attention at the end of a long day.